Okay, everyone, welcome to our Safer Cleaning at Home Tips and Techniques Against Coronavirus webinar. My name is Erica. I'm with the Learning Disabilities Association of America. Um, and with me today is Tracy Gregoire, Betty Riggin, Pam Smith, and Dr. Lewis Allen. Um, Basically, a few, a few housekeeping items in the beginning. Um, if you are joining us via the computer, welcome. Um, we'll be taking questions at the end of the webinar. If you would like to type your questions in to the Q&A section on the bottom, it says Q&A and has two little chat bubbles. I'll be, ha I'll be monitoring those throughout the webinar and we'll have 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the webinar to answer them. Um, if you are joining us via phone, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to type into the Q&A but you will be able to hit star six to unmute yourself. Please do not do this if you are on speakerphone, it'll cause feedback issues and I'll be forced to mute you back up again. Um, but if you have a question at that time, please hit star six, unmute yourself and you'll be able to ask your questions then. Um, I'm happy to introduce Tracy Gregoire, who is the Healthy Children Project Coordinator for LDA. She runs LDA's coalition of 25 state affiliates working to reduce chemical exposures that harm brain health. She has over 15 years of experience in environmental health policy and education and her, earned her BA in environmental studies and her secondary education certification from Bates College. Tracy, take it away. Thank you, Erica, and thank you everyone for joining this evening. Um, so as as um, Erica shared, um, the Healthy Children Project for the Healthy Children Project Coordinator for the Learning Disabilities Association of America. Um, and Betty Regan is my co-presenter. She's a sustainable housekeeping instructor. Um, Betty, do you wanna introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Betty. And um, thank you, Tracy, for having me. Thank you to the Learning Disabilities Association for the powerfully important work that you do. I am Betty. I teach sustainable housekeeping from my home at Sophia's house in Lewiston, Maine. Great, thank you, Betty. Um, and I am also in Maine, although LD of America is headquartered in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, also with us today is Pam Smith. Um, she is muted at the moment, but she is um, a nurse and is part of LDA of Texas. Um, and also Healthy Children Project um, volunteer. So thank you, Pam, for joining us today. And on the phone, we have Dr. Um, Lois Allen, who is with LDA of Utah, um, who's a retired pediatrician. And so Pam and Dr. Lewis are here to help with any medical questions during the Q&A at the end of this webinar. And Tracy, Dr. Allen is muted, but he will be unmuted for any medical questions that you need him to be. Great, thank you, Erica. Mm -hmm. um, so just a little bit first about the Learning Disabilities Association of America. Um, LDA of America um, mission is to create opportunities for success for all individuals, both adults and children affected by learning disabilities through support, education and advocacy. You might be wondering why LDA is talking about cleaning and disinfectants. Um, the reason we are doing that is because our Healthy Children Project, which I run, works to prevent exposure to harmful chemicals that are linked to learning, intellectual and developmental disabilities. So any of those disabilities um, that are linked to neurological harm or neurological challenges. Um, and we work to protect the health of all families from unnecessary toxic chemicals in our products, food, water, and air. The reason we do this work um, is because we know that learning and developmental disabilities result from a comp complex interaction of factors, genetics, low birth weight, nutrition, toxic chemicals. Um, but we also know that early um, exposure to chemicals, including prenatal and early childhood exposure, can harm brain health, even from low doses of harmful chemicals. We also know that the National Academy of Sciences states that environmental factors, including toxic chemicals, contribute to over a quarter of these disabilities. So that's a little bit about why LDA does this work. A um, few disclaimers before we get going. Um, Betty and I are not healthcare provider, 
um, professionals, scientists, or experts on viruses. Um, we did research heavily and spent many hours looking online at credible sources to get the latest information on the coronavirus um, and how to protect yourself. And we also do a lot of work on harmful chemicals and know quite a bit about chemicals and cleaning products as well as other products that might be in your home. We're going to focus this webinar on how to protect yourself from coronavirus. We are going to go over some of the information that you probably heard a lot, but is worth repeating. Um, we're going to talk about how to identify and use um, safer cleaners and disinfectants to limit your exposure to some of these harmful chemicals. And we're also going to talk about proper cleaning technique, which I'm really excited about because I've joined other webinars on the coronavirus and cleaning. But one thing a lot of folks don't talk about is proper cleaning technique and that um, goes a long way to protect yourself from coronavirus as well as other viruses and also bacteria and other things that make us sick. Um, we are focusing on home cleaning um, today and not schools, child cares, workplaces, or other public places. The main focus is on cleaning and cleaning techniques and limiting, like I said, your exposure to harmful chemicals. Um, but some of the resources are still helpful for other places, but our focus is on your home. So first, some um, terminology um, from Betty. Okay, so we are going uh, throughout this workshop. We're going to use the Center for Disease Control's definition for cleaning and disinfecting. So cleaning refers to the removal of dirt and impurities, including germs, from surfaces. Cleaning does not necessarily kill germs, but by removing germs, it decreases their number and therefore any risk of spreading infection. Now disinfecting works, um, disinfecting works by using chemicals. For example, the EPA registered disinfectants to kill germs on surfaces. This process does not necessarily clean dirty surfaces nor remove germs, but killing germs remaining on a surface after cleaning, further reducing any risk of spreading infection. So now when we refer to germs, we mean all the biological creatures that you are protecting yourself and your family against by cleaning, whether it be virus, bacteria, mold spores. Throughout this workshop, we will mostly be referring to the COVID-19 virus. Now, the explanation of what a virus is, is paraphrased from a New York Times article dated March 13th of 2020, called How a Coronavirus Hijacks Your Cells. So, a virus is not a living creature, but a very small bundle of DNA and RNA protected in a bubble of oily, lipid molecules, and a lipid is a type of fat. So when the virus enters the body, either through the nose, through the mouth, or through the eyes, it attaches to a living cell and it hijacks it. And it uses the cell to make proteins that keep the immune system from attacking, while it also uses the cell to make more copies of the virus. So eventually, the infected cell dies and millions of viruses are released from the mass of dead cell material. Next slide. Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulty. Here we go. <laughs> um, so today we are focusing on the coronavirus. Um, you may have heard the virus called different names. Um, when referring to the to the disease, we use the name coronavirus disease or COVID-19, and we'll use both of those today. When referring to the virus that causes COVID-19, the official name is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2 for short. COVID-19 is a new disease, and there is limited information regarding risk factors for the severe disease. Um, the CDC does state that vulnerable populations are believed to be people over 65 and people with underlying med medical conditions. These conditions include heart disease, chronic lung disease like asthma, diabetes, people undergoing cancer treatment, and people with weakened immune systems. 
Let's go over some of the basic information, uh, although you've already heard it, because it's important. Transmission from person to person happens most frequently within six feet of an infected person via respiratory droplets from a cough or sneeze um, and do not stay in the air very long. So um, some key things that you can do, um, which I'm sure you've heard, but again, are important to note um, to protect yourself from COVID-19. Um, the chemistry of soap is extremely effective at destroying the coronavirus, which is good news. Wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Get in between your fingers, dry, for, fully dry your hands with a towel as wet hands transmit more germs than dry ones. Another helpful tip is to get, keep your nails short and remember to clean under your nails. If you do not have soap and water, as I'm sure you've heard, the CDC says to use alcohol-based sanitizer that is at least 60% alcohol. Um, I also found it interesting that the CDC notes that baby wipes may make your hands look clean, but they're not designed to remove germs from your hands. Um, avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. Um, we should all be staying home as much as possible, but if it is especially important to remain at home if you are sick. And when you go out, social distancing is key and washing your hands or using hand sanitizer often. When you get home for added protection, you can try to shower and wash your clothes if possible as an extra protection. The reason why social distancing works is because when an infected person coughs or sneezes, the virus is in the water droplets that can go six feet or so before dropping to the ground. Um, they are now saying that the coronavirus may spread from people talking or breathing, and we'll share that resource. This is especially concerning since a small number of studies has shown that 25 to 50 percent of people may have no symptoms at all. Um, and if it can be spread by people talking or breathing, obviously that could help explain why it's spreading so quickly. Um, there was an Iceland study um, where they tested, intentionally tested people without symptoms. They tested about 18,000 people to date, and um, half of those people tested positive and um, said they had no symptoms or no noticeable symptoms. Um, in addition to people seem to be contagious um, before they have symptoms. So for all of these reasons, staying at home as much as possible um, is really key. Um, so um, you may have heard, um, you know, we talk about the water droplets um, and that being a main way that they think this, the COVID-19 is, um, is spreading. You may have heard about some studies that show that COVID-19 or the coronavirus stays on surfaces for a long period of time, um, including a New England Journal of Medicine study, which we'll share. That study found that the virus is viable for up to 72 hours on plastics, 48 hours on stainless steel, 24 hours on cardboard, four hours on copper, um, it is also detectable in the air for three hours. Um, one important note on this, that all may sound really scary, but John Hopkins Hospital experts, and again, we'll share that resource, explained it this way. Yes, the virus can live on surfaces um, up to 72 hours, but what's more important is the amount of virus that means, which is just a tiny fraction of, of the virus. Um, as of um, this weekend, there seemed to be no proof that people were contracting, contact, contracting the virus from surfaces, and there was no evidence that the coronavirus was spread through the mail. Um, but we do know that respiratory viruses like colds can be spread by somebody um, who has a virus contaminating those surfaces. So that is why cleaning and disinfecting is recommended and why we'll talk about it today. So now over to Betty to talk about the chemistry of why soap and water works. Okay, so all cleaning is done by water in motion. Water molecules are linked like a long chain, which gives water in motion its power to pick up everything and carry it away if anything that's in its path. Now oily, fatty or sticky substances are really dense. And so these chains of water molecules can slide over the top of them. 
Now, any soap or detergent is helpful to the water because it soap molecules breaks up the chains and makes the water waterier, more thinner. And the water molecules can then get down into the fat molecules, break them up and carry them away. Now, soap is only helpful if it is thoroughly blended into the water. And in the case of viruses, the water needs to be completely soapy and given enough motion and time to work on the virus's fat protective bubble. So in 20 seconds of agitation, meaning the hand washing, the soapy water destroys that fat bubble, lays open the virus and it dissolves. So we're actually going to share here the uh, box video link on how soap and water and proper hand washing gets the coronavirus off your hands. Tracy? Yes. Um, so we will share that when we share the recording and resources. Um, so it is important to note that um, any soap works if you wash your hands properly, but not all soaps are created equal. Soaps like cleaners and disinfectants can contain harmful chemicals. Um, the CDC states that there's no proof that antibacterial soaps work better than regular soap and antibacterial ingredients have harmful chemicals in them. The Food and Drug Administration or FDA agrees and ruled that there is not enough scientific evidence to prove that antibacterial soaps are any more effective at preventing illness than just plain old soap and water. The FDA even banned some antibacterial ingredients because there is no additional health effects and there might be actually harmful effects to those antibacterial chemicals. In addition, too much use of antibacterial agents increases antibiotic resistant bacteria, which is obviously a big problem. So um, our advice is to please skip the antibacterial soaps and just use soap and water. There can be other harmful chemicals in soaps and everyday household cleaners, um, including ingredients like phthalates, which are linked to neurological harm and are often used as fragrances. So if an item says fragrance, it's probably a synthetic chemical and most likely one or more phthalate chemicals in it. Triclosan and other antibacterials should be avoided as well as parabens and some of those other chemicals. So finding a soap um, that um, has less ingredients in it and just knowing that you need to get um, as much sudsy water going and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds is our recommendation. So um, before we get into cleaning and disinfecting, we need to remember that disinfectants and cleaning products can be poisonous. Um, the World Health Organization, or WHO, warns about early exposure to chemicals during childhood, which I've talked about earlier. One of the main sources of poisoning in house is household cleaning products. Um, and I looked up the 2018, which is the most recent stats for poison control, and they stated um, that many of these products contain harmful even poisonous ingredients. In fact, in 2018, over 7% of poison control calls were cleaning product related. And in this chart to the right, you'll see that 11% were prescriptions or non-prescription uh, medications, but the second leading cause of calls to poison control was the cleaning, the household cleaning substances, um, which is kind of scary. Um, and then co cosmetics and personal care products, believe it or not, came in third. Um, so we're encouraging you to select products carefully and always store products out of reach of children and don't mix ingredients like bleach and ammonia. It could be deadly. Um, so with some other precautions we would like to share. Um, the majority of the of popular disinfectants found in your average store, like grocery store or department store, or at least until recently when things started to be selling out, um, contain either quaternary ammonium chlorides, which we'll um, call QUATS for short, Q-U-A-T-S, um, or, or chlorine bleach. So a lot of these products contain either QUATS or chlorine bleach. While effective, these ingredients are often overkill and have, a really, have really potent toxic chemicals in them. 
Um, the EPA list N is a list of products that they believe are effective against the coronavirus based on data and other coronaviruses that are out there um, and research that has been done. This list seems more geared towards use in a more professional setting and many of the products, product active ingredients are actually pesticides. Um, in fact, soap cannot be on their list because it's not a pesticide and it's not regulated by the EPA. In our opinion, many of these products should be reserved for, for professional use and should um, not be used in our homes unless absolutely needed and when used should be used sparingly and with great caution. And we'll go over some of that. The good news is that there are safer options that are less toxic, which uh, Betty will talk about soon. Um, there are many health Hazards associated with chlorine bleach. Um, bleach is a significant lung and eye irritant. Extended exposure can cause chemical burns on the skin. In terms of cleaning products, it is a leading clause of chemical eye injuries in children in the US and in, cleaning, in the cleaning products category, which I went over the 7% for the 2018 stats, it is also the leading reason people call poison control. If you do choose to use bleach, please, please, please be careful. Wear gloves when using bleach and never mix it with ammonia. That could be deadly. Um, you only mix it with the water. Um, we also read to be careful with urine as urine is, is ammonia. So flush the toilet first if you're using bleach in the toilet. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention recommends a diluted bleach solution of a third cup bleach per one gallon of water. It is also worth taking a moment to talk about QUATS and Women's Voices for the Earth, which again, another resource we'll share with you by email, goes into QUATS a lot more, but QUATS, um, the active ingredient often shows up in the ingredient list as alkaline, dimethyl, benzyl, ammonium chloride. <laughs> and again, we'll share that with you. QUATS are overkill and harmful in our potent skin and lung irritants and are linked to asthma, reproductive harm, and possible birth defects. Widespread use of quads, which unfortunately are in a lot of products that are sold on store shelves, um, is contributing to the global problem of antimicrobial resistance. So those really resistant strains to antibiotics and superbugs that cannot be controlled with antibiotics. Um, I also just want to mention briefly some ingredients that have not been shown to be effective against coronavirus, even though they are safe. Um, um, include vinegar, which a lot of people use for home cleaning, which is great and good for cleaning in general, but it has not been shown to do anything against the coronavirus. Um, in addition, some people are talking about using like drinking alcohol like vodka as a cleaner. And even though vodka might be up to 80% proof, that is only actually 40% alcohol and doesn't meet the 60% guideline for the CDC. So we're discouraging people from using alcohol and drinking alcohol as well. So now, after all of that, we can finally get to cleaning, disinfecting, and proper techniques. Okay, so now we know that terminology, the key information on the coronavirus, uh, we know why soap works, and the ingredients to try to avoid. So now we're going to get to the cleaning. So let's remember the definition of cleaning. It's the removal of dirt and germs from surfaces. Cleaning alone does not necessarily kill germs, but by removing germs, it decreases their number and it is a really important step before disinfecting. Um, cleaning is all about technique, which we mentioned very few people are talking about that. So now we're gonna talk about that. Tools and techniques for cleaning. Next slide. Um, to save money and the environment, use washcloths instead of paper towels. And um, after having a cleaning business for many, many years and now teaching it, this is the technique that I've come up with that's most cost effective and most efficient. So if you'll take a washcloth, just a regular washcloth, fold it into quarters because that's about the size of your hand and that's really all you can control when you're going to clean. So um, be mindful that you have to keep a clean cloth to the surface that you're cleaning because you cannot clean with a dirty cloth. You're only gonna smear the dirt and germs around. 
So after a few wipes with this cloth, this is gonna be a dirty surface now, but what you do is you take this corner and you fold it up over the top and you have a new clean side. And away you go, you're cleaning some more, you get another couple of good swipes on there, and now this side is dirty. So you still have another corner. So you lift that corner up and fold it over to the back and you have another clean side. So you keep on cleaning, you're cleaning, you're cleaning. Now by this time, it's about time to unfold your cloth and you'll be able to see that there's three dirty squares and there's one clean square. So at that point, you can refold your cloth. It's about the size of your hand, which is all you can control, and you're gonna finish cleaning. Now also at that point, you can have a look at your cloth and decide if um, what you're cleaning up is really sloppy and messy and it's soaking through the other side. And if that's the case, you need to wash your cloth out. If you're only dusting, you'll probably get eight clean sides because you can fold the cloth to the other side and get eight clean sides out of it. Now, if what you're cleaning up is really sticky or gooey or oily, when you go to rinse your cloth out to reuse it, you're gonna have to clean it out with soapy water so, because it's gonna get the oils and stuff out of there. And then when you rinse this cloth out, you wring it out because it's water in motion is what's gonna take all the dirt out of this cloth. So then, a word about streaks. So they're most visible on a window, but this concept applies to every surface that you clean. Streaks happen when cleaning water is left on the surface. It dries and the solids are left behind after the water has evaporated. So now these solids are anything that you intended to be cleaning up, dust, grime, germs, and there is some advertising that tells you that their product is going to give you a streak free shine. They are lying to you. Streaks are about technique, not product. So to eliminate streaks, I suggest that you have your cleaning cloth in one hand and then in the other hand you have a drying cloth. Clean the surface and then dry the surface. Drying is the last step to cleaning and do not leave this step out. After your cleaning cloth now is spent, you've rinsed it out a bunch of times and it's just doesn't seem like it's going to do the job anymore. You can put it in the laundry basket and use your drying cloth now as your cleaning cloth. Then get a fresh, dry, folded cloth into quarters and continue cleaning. So now a word about spray bottles. Most cleaning products are sold to us in spray bottles. And when using cleaning products, spraying them through the air to reach the surface to be cleaned is the least desirable method of application. Many household cleaning chemicals are volatile. Now the word volatile means they evaporate quickly into the air. So this pretty much guarantees that you're going to breathe it in and you're losing a lot of the product to evaporation. So I suggest that you use a squirt bottle and squirt the cleaner onto your cloth. This is much safer, it's a more direct application, and you continue to be in control of the process. But you always, always label your squirt bottles with the name and the active ingredient in the cleaner. Now then, using a squirt bottle applies when you're using general cleaning products. In the case of disinfecting, however, the disinfectant must completely coat the pre-cleaned surface and remained wet for 10 minutes for the disinfectant to be effective against this virus. In the case of spray bottles then, it is the most effective way to completely coat the surface. Okay, so next slide please. When and why to disinfect? Okay, I'm just really gonna read these notes because I don't wanna miss anything. This is just so important. So typically disinfecting is not part of routine cleaning. Keeping surfaces, kitchens, bathroom clean with soap and water or a non-toxic multi-surface cleaner and using good technique is adequate to keep a safe, clean and comfortable home in most situations. But this pandemic is anything but normal. We know COVID-19 lives on surfaces. We know there are many people who are more vulnerable and need more protection. And many of us 
are going to have family members in our homes that have the virus. So let's talk about the disinfecting again. Disinfecting works by using chemicals to kill germs on surfaces. This process does not necessarily clean dirty surfaces or remove germs, but killing germs remaining on the surface after cleaning further reduces any risk of spreading infection. Now remember to clean the surface first before disinfecting to get the best results. Now, for many items in your home that are touched the most, like doorknobs and door jams, it's really not practical to use enough soap and water to clean that surface. You would have soapy water everywhere. So disinfecting is ideal for those surfaces. Now the CDC recommends including these items touched the most often by people like doorknobs, counters, electric devices like cell phones, light switches, keyboards. Our homes are full of them and everybody touches them often. And these surfaces need to be disinfected often to kill the virus because soapy water is just not practical. Electric devices and um, electronics just can't stand the water. So they need to go right straight to being disinfected. Okay, so now a word on how often to disinfect. Okay, so during this virus crisis, we're asked to only call our doctor if we have symptoms and to only go to the hospital if we have shortness of breath. So the vast majority of these cases of illness, people are gonna be at home. So the CDC is suggesting that we disinfect commonly touched surfaces often. That light switch, for instance, is only disinfected until somebody with germy hands touches it. Surfaces are only disinfected until a sick person breathes over it, so prevention is everything. Wash your hands with the soap and water. If there is a possibility that you're sick, wear a mask if you're moving around your home. Isolate in one room to protect your household. If a separate bathroom for the sick person is not possible, then disinfect the shared bathroom after each time that sick person has been in there, but before the next person goes in. But don't wait, but do wait as long as possible after the sick person has left to let those breathed respiratory droplets settle out of the air. Next slide, please. Safer disinfectants. Phew. Just like soap, not all disinfectants are created equal, and we know that some of these are more harmful given their ingredients. Now, our homes are going to be constantly bathed with these disinfectants for months to come, so it's important to select safer, non-toxic disinfectants whenever possible. There are several less toxic products that appear both on the CDC list of improved disinfectants against the virus and on the Environmental Working Group's list of safer products. And it's also important to note that the CDC continues to update their list of new disinfectants that they are approving as being effective against the virus. Now, so the active ingredients in these safer products are alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, thymol, lactic acid, and citric acid. They are effective and safer than chlorine and ammonia. So in the case of the disinfectants now, adequate time is required to allow the disinfectant to get through that fatty barrier to reveal the virus inside. So dis disinfectants don't require as much moisture and as much agitation to do their job, but the surface does need to be wet with the disinfectant for several minutes. In fact, the EPA's site says up to 10 minutes, depending on the product of the active ingredient. So we're recommending that you just leave the disinfectant on for 10 minutes to err on the side of caution. Now, alcohol, like as in a hand sanitizer, breaks up the fats, so it will clean both the fingerprints, the oils from our fingers, and dissolve the protective fat bubble around the virus on these surfaces. But when using alcohol, the surface has got to be wet long enough and the alcohol needs to be left on the surface for that whole 10 minutes. 
Now, if you're also cleaning and disinfecting at the same time, there does need to be a little agitation, meaning a little wiping for the alcohol to be both effective for cleaning and disinfecting at the same time. So now the cool thing about hydrogen peroxide is that the CDC says it deactivates the rhinovirus, which is actually harder to kill than the coronavirus. And I just happen to be a big hydrogen peroxide fan. <laughs> so um, there have been several uh, successful tests of hydrogen peroxide and alcohol on human coronaviruses. Now, not the COVID-19, but SARS and MERS and similar viruses die, my darlings, with the hydrogen peroxide or the alcohol. Now, a word about the disinfecting wipes. Disinfecting wipes only carry enough moisture to coat a small area. It's not like cleaning with a cloth. You're applying a disinfectant that completely has to coat the surface with moisture and give an adequate time to evaporate. So the disinfectant wipes only cover maybe about the size of a doorknob. You, you, just, you can tell when you wipe it how quickly that moisture comes out of the cloth and onto the surface. Okay, so um, next slide, please. Tools and techniques. Okay, these are the tools that you're gonna need for disinfecting during the virus crisis. You're gonna, gonna need cleaning gloves to protect your hands from the disinfectant. You're gonna need a cloth mask, which is going to protect you some from the respiratory droplets in the air, but it is not going to protect you against the fumes from the disinfectants. Fresh air is gonna protect you from breathing these volatile chemicals of these disinfectants and to keep the volume of the respiratory droplets uh, down to a minimum. So bathroom fans are generally inadequate to the task of drawing in fresh air. So if at all possible, you need to open a window, fresh air is gonna be required if you're gonna be disinfecting all the time. And you're also gonna need washcloths especially since paper products are at a premium right now. So um, use a washcloth to clean the surfaces before disinfecting, like we discussed, and rinsing the surface after disinfecting is gonna be the same procedure as general cleaning. Just make sure that you're using gloves because many disinfectants can be absorbed through your skin. Make sure you're drying when you're done so that you're not leaving any of the residue after the wiping is all um, evaporated. And then also uh, rinse out your washcloths before you throw them in the laundry because many of these chemicals could damage your clothing, but you don't have to worry about the germs lingering after it goes through the laundry. So you can wash them with your regular clothes. Next slide, Tracy. That's you. unmute myself. Um, so just some summary and key points as well as some resources before we go to question and answer period. Um, so following the CDC guidelines of washing your hands, social distancing, staying at home and wearing masks is, are all really important to protecting yourself. And obviously if most people in the home are staying or all people in the home are staying home, you're not going to be bringing germs into the home and needing to disinfect all the time. Um, general cleaning is an important defense against the virus and knowing how to clean effectively with good technique, thank you Betty, um, is really important and something that most people do not talk about. Um, when you do use a disinfectant, selecting the safest possible options like isopropyl alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, thymol, lactic acid, and citric acid are all really important. Um, and avoiding the most toxic disinfectants like quats, chlorine, and chlorine bleach when possible um, is also very important. Um, we will get through this and LDA is a source of information for you. So please let us know how we can help. Um, so I just wanna go over some of the resources and the good news is all the things that you heard us talk about in the research and the articles we're going to send you a nice email with a link to the recording and a link um, and a lot of different resources and linking them all so you can just go right to those pages for where we've cited um, and that's our resources up and through like yesterday or today we try to have the most 
um, up-to-date information as possible, but obviously um, more and more is learned about um, COVID-19 every day. So some of the resources that we'll highlight for you and send in that email include the Healthy Children Project. We have our own program website, healthychildrenproject.org, and ldaofamerica.org also has a lot of great resources, including how to support your, your kids or um, that might have special needs and IEPs and 504s during the SWAT time and what you can do to support them. So there's a lot of resources on our general webpage as well. Women's Voices for the Earth, I just want to give a shout out for because they are a great partner and they shared willingly all of their information and I was emailing with them up through today about the latest information on um, you know, the, the safest disinfectants and why and the latest research they have been doing. So we'll share um, information and direct links to their, their website. And they also have a whole section on quats and fact sheets on quats um, as well, which is the, um, that we talked about a little or touched upon a little bit in this training. Um, you can also look up your cleaners um, on environmental working groups. Um, guides to safer cleaners and you can actually look up they'll share all the ingredients and which ones are of concern and why um, made safe is another great resource that we'll also share that um, like really rigorously looks at products and the ingredients that are in them um, this training um, was actually partly in honor of Healthy Schools Day, which is today and Healthy Schools Week. Um, and Healthy Schools Network has a lot of resources and we'll share those. Um, CDC obviously has a lot of resources on the coronavirus. Um, and we have the Poison Control website. And like I said, we have many other resources that we'll share by email that we um, touched upon in this training today. So now we would love to open it up for questions. Um, and I know Erica has been kind of keeping an eye on the Q&A box and there might be some. There are, a few, there are a few questions and a couple of statements um, that our participants have made. Thank you very much for that. Again, if you want to ask a question of our participants, um, please use the Q&A box or the chat box and I will see that and give them the, the questions. Our first question came um, early on in the presentation when you mentioned the EPA list and it says, what do you mean the EPA list only has pesticides on it? So the EPA, believe it or not, like, um, different agencies right, um, are responsible for looking at different classes of products. And the EPA list, the EPA, they call it um, the list N, which is their list of uh, cleaning products that um, they believe are effective against the coronavirus based on other coronaviruses and similar type viruses. But that list um, is, um, actually like they're they're looking at products that contain pesticides so a lot of these uh, ingredients in cleaning products are actually pesticides right a pesticide is something that kills a pest um, and can kill things like viruses so soap and water you will not find on that list because it's not a pesticide so it's not covered by that list and we'll send a link to that. And it's also important to note when you go to that list, they're updating that every week with new products um, and trying to fast track ones that they think might um, be most effective against the coronavirus. And a cool trick when you go to that list because it's got hundreds of products on it, they actually list like the active ingredient, um, the product name and there's a little arrow that you can push and you can sort by the active ingredient. So if you want to see all the products that have lactic acid or citric acid on it, um, you can do that. If you want to look at all the seventh generation products, you can go to that, the column that has it says product name and you can click on that arrow and it will sort that list by the product name. Um, so it's a really handy resource, but it's, you know, it's a you know, mostly got ingredients, pesticide ingredients in those products. Okay, um, we have a, um, some feedback from Claire. Thank you, Claire. Um, EPA registers disinfectants approved for specific target organisms. Not all disinfectants will attack germs. In the supermarket, be sure to read the label to see what target organisms are listed. Um, there's lots of coronavirus listed on those. Disinfectants are pesticides. Please never ask children to use disinfecting wipes. Right. Absolutely. 
Yes, and I, I believe it's probably Claire Barnett from the Healthy Schools Network. Absolutely, yes. and Chlor <laughs> yes, chlorine, and we'll share that resource. Um, chlorine whites. I'm so thankful. My son, who's 11, he's on the autism spectrum. They do not use chlorine wipes, and I'm so thankful because they often do have kids right wipe things down, like the tablets and computers and stuff. And you do not want kids using that. And in general, you probably don't want kids using cleaners either. And you want to be very careful when they are using them and selecting those very carefully because obviously we teach our kids to clean. But yeah, don't be giving kids chlorine wipes, um, Clorox wipes. Those are not good for them to be touching with their hands. Um, um, I have a new question. Um, is Lysol spray a good disinfectant? It is on the list, but it's got some pretty nasty chemicals in there. Um, and they're like, like the ones we went over, the hydrogen peroxide, the isopropyl alcohol, the lactic acid, the citric acid, those are safer ones to use. And unfortunately, a lot of the cleaning products also have quats in them. Um, and we can send out that long name that quats are under, coronary. I even forget it. I have to look it up myself. Um, but like you have to be diligent and look at the labels or look at EWG or, or Women's Voices for the Earth and look for some ones that they suggest. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of those um, household cleaning products that are that are sold on the shelf as household cleaning products have quads, which um, really should be left to the professionals. Okay, um, we have a, another question. Um, is it wise to run a disinfecting wipe over mail or grocery packages that are delivered? Betty, you want to take that one? We'd have to unmute. There I am. Um, the thing about the virus, and you may uh, double check with me on this, Tracy, but um, when um, the virus comes whooping out of somebody's mouth or nose and it lands on anything fibrous, whether it's paper, cardboard, carpeting, these, um, the virus is really sticky. It's got that fat um, protective coating on it. And so it kind of gets hung up in the fibers. So the virus can live on these surfaces for however many hours they've determined in a laboratory setting. But when your finger now comes back to touch that, you're picking up really a very small amount of what's on that paper. So, and there's been no indication that uh, anybody's getting it through the mail, which is on paper. And the mailman is handling all the paper and it's going from to, touching all the doorknobs in your neighborhood. So is it wise? Perhaps wise. Is it necessary? Perhaps not. It's really difficult to say, <laughs> especially since we're really early in on this virus. But I live in an apartment building and there are very many of us that are over 60. Several of us have hep C. There's a couple of um, heart uh, issue people in this uh, building. We have a diabetic here. And the, the rules of the building are that we have groceries delivered to us by a volunteer that's young and strong and with no um, problems going out. Thank you for the volunteers. <laughs> but we do wipe down all of the packaging. For me, I always like to wipe down the packaging anyway, because all of this product has been traveling in the bed of a truck, like maybe five trucks by the time it gets to you. So any can, anything, I um, wipe anyway. And I also wash my uh, vegetables and fruits. So I'm thinking, yeah, to be on the safe side. Yeah, and Pam. Is it necessary, maybe not, but you know, it's, that's really a gray area and it's a great question. I have several friends that are really at an immune response risk and we've been told to just put that noose and that mail to the side, put it out in the garage, put it somewhere, go in and wash your hands. If you get a package, take the package, open the package, dump out the contents and walk that cardboard outside. Mm -hmm. And so we just kind of give it, there's nothing that has to be opened right away. 
and usually it just kind of sits for a couple of days and then we open it. I mean, we have, we have them in stages now. <laughs> right. Um, right. Just one more little piece on that. These viruses do not have superpowers. They don't jump and they don't fly. They're not coming after you. You know what I'm saying? So the only way it's going to get from any pathogen into your body is by your hand. So bring those groceries in, set them down, wash your hands, or bring them in, put them away, and wash your hands. The washing of the hands is everything right now, is what I'm thinking. So a related question is, how do you recommend cleaning food packs that arrive at your doorstep for DIY meal prep, like Blue Apron? Lots of food packaged in plastic and paper instructions with recipes. Um, well, just like we talked about, uh, soap and water, it takes some rubbing, it just as if you were washing your hands, that will dissolve any, um, of those tiniest little molecules that just happen to be on there. Uh, wipe them down with, uh, like a alcohol disinfectant wipe. Um, they do generate a ton of packaging, that's for sure. I've seen them a couple of times. I don't usually buy them, <laughs> but um, yeah, just um, it, it, the virus apparently from what Tracy said, it does last on plastic for quite a while. So I would wipe them off with, um, I guess if I was to do that, I would probably wipe it off with a, a disinfectant cloth or get some, squirt some alcohol on your cleaning rag and give it a good wipe. Right, and just know if it's like packaging that has holes in it. Obviously, you don't want to get those chemicals onto the food, but if it's right, like right, right. totally encased and there's no, like I'm thinking of raspberries come in these things that have like holes in them, mm -hmm. but other things that it's just plastic, you could disinfect that plastic. Um, okay. So um, it depends on what it is. And Claire, Claire has sent us another message. Um, Alicia Culver has called the end list for safer disinfectants. And she says that wipes work only if they're used exactly as directed. One wipe is not disinfecting. Yeah. Gotta follow the directions. <laughs> you really do. <laughs> and right. uh, doc Dr. Allen has weighed in and says, I believe Lysol has bleach in it. So that should be taken into consideration as well. Yeah. Read the directions. I mean, read the ingredient list. And if it's got uh, methyl or ethyl or um, dimethyl or ammonium, these things you really don't want around your food. You don't want them around your face. You just really don't. There's, there's safer ways to go. Okay. And I think that is the end of our questions, actually. Um, so I think we're going to wrap things up. Um, thank you, ladies, for joining us. Thank you, Tracy and Betty and oh, Pam um, and Dr. Allen, who has been chatting with me here and there because he <laughs> can't get some audio. Um, and actually, Dr. Allen just weighed in about packages carrying to the garage, wait 72 hours as a starter and use a squirt bottle with alcohol. Right. Yeah. And if you're like got susceptible people in your household, obviously people, unfortunately, who are totally healthy have gotten this really seriously or died. But if you've got somebody who is at high risk, you just want to take all the precautions that you can. Um, but also now, right, like, you know, whenever you can choose products, cleaning and disinfectants with, with right, safer ingredients and keep them all locked up and away from your kids and pets. Um, so we will send out um, with Erica's help, uh, you know, the recording as soon as it's available. And like I said, lots of resources. Feel free to email me, Tracy at ldaamerica.org. Um, and we will do your best to answer those questions. And, um, you know, we'll, you know, welcome people sharing this cleaning training with folks that you know to get the word out there. We want this to be um, as shared with as many people as possible. So thank you everybody for joining and thank you Erica for all of your help and for Betty and Pam mm -hmm. and Dr. Allen for joining as well. I actually have one more question, believe it or not. Oh good. Um, right now in some places you can't get alcohol or hydrogen peroxide. What is the third choice? 
the lactic acid and the citric acid ingredients. And again, we'll send out that EPA list N. Um, I know I was going, I mean, we were not endorsing any particular products, but we know that a number of seventh generation products are on the list and I have some of those in my home. Um, but I was going to their website and they were saying, yes, we know that a lot of our products are, you know, are out of stock and we are working as hard as possible to restock those shelves. So I think we're going to be starting to see more options coming back in. I've actually seen commercials or ads on YouTube about, you know, from like actually the toilet maker, toilet paper maker saying the same thing. Like we are working like you know, people who are making these cleaners are working really hard to get them back on store shelves. And I'm sure the isopropyl alcohol and the hydrogen peroxide, right, trying to get more of that out because they know those things are off store shelves. And just to note again, when you're using isopropyl alcohol or hydrogen peroxide, don't dilute it. Use it straight from the bottle. Don't dilute it or it's not going to be as effective. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I know it's frustrating right now because some of these things are off store shelves, but I would recommend even though it's not proven that just cleaning with soap and water um, on surfaces kills it, like it's still a good start. Like do whatever cleaning you can. It's therapeutic. I scrubbed my teapot, which has never been cleaner. And I felt so much better after doing that for 20 minutes, seriously, because I just had all this nervous energy. I don't want that to go to my kid, right? Like we want to be taking care of our families and cleaning is therapeutic. And because we're spending so much time in our homes, having a clean environment is going to help um, and then just keep you know having people if you can't go to the store have somebody else check for you because i think we're going to be seeing some of those products back on store shelves hopefully really soon okay so now i think we are really done with questions um and like tracy said i'm going to endeavor to get you guys the replay for this as well as um the resources that tracy shared with me within 24 hours barring any tech issues. So thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you again to Tracy, Betty, Pam, and Dr. Allen, who's um, graciously fed me information since he can't <laughs> connect. Um, and have a great night, everyone. Thank, thank you. you so much.